Uh, I was contacted in late 2005 by the archivist at the University of Newcastle where I had worked. I'm, I'd been retired for some years. He had come across in the archives a volume that had been bought some years previously and forgotten about. Um, he wanted it identified for valuation purposes because of insurance and so on. The volume was handwritten, entirely handwritten, uh, and it consisted of 318 pages in French. And when you turned it over and started reading at the other end, it consisted of 40 pages in English. No indication of who had written it, uh, except there was a little label on the spine of the leather-covered volume, which was falling apart, which said Jarry, J-A-R-R-Y, Tome 1. And uh, that was the only indication as to authorship. So knowing that I had been Professor of French at Newcastle for some years, the archivist thought I might be able to identify what this French was all about. And it consisted of two long articles, or treatises on military matters. So I thought, oh, well, this will be quite simple. I'll just go to the internet and work it out. So I went to the internet and Googled the name Jarry and found that there were 1,250,000 entries under that name. So it wasn't going to be a simple matter at all. Uh, as to the English, it referred to some work being done at or near Port Macquarie and from the fa fact that one of the diary, it was a diary, the fact that one of the diary entries said that he leased something for one year from the present instant to June 1840, you could date the diary as 1839. I discovered in a, a website from the University of Sydney, of all places, that there was a general, François Jarry. And so I looked up François Jarry, I now had a first name, but there was a Canadian pop singer called François Jarry and there were still 250,000 entries under that. But eventually I narrowed it down to a man called General François Jarry who had been head of the military school in Berlin for Frederick the Great of Prussia for 20 years and after Frederick's death went to France, back to France He'd been an academic in the military school, teaching field craft and so on. He went to France and showed that a lot of academics aren't very practical. And he made a few disastrous blunders as a general, with the result that they told him his services were no longer required. So he went to England, where he became tutor to the son of a duke, and um, met up with a, another military man called Colonel John Gaspard Le Marchant, and started giving lectures in Le Marchant's school, which was in the Antelope Inn at High Wycombe, out of London. And that was given royal patronage and called the Royal Military College, High Wycombe. And in 1812 or thereabouts moved to Sandhurst and became the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. It's not widely known that so British an institution as the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst was co-founded by a Frenchman. You can imagine the English don't want to make too big a thing about that. So my search then went on for the writer of the diary in English. And it, I was able to get some historical material about Port Macquarie. And eventually was able to narrow it down from the names of people mentioned. If the writer of the diary mentioned Mr. Tozer, for instance, well, I knew the writer wasn't Mr. Tozer because he mentioned Mr. Tozer. Narrowed it down, narrowed it down, till eventually I found out it was a man called Colonel Charles George Gray. And um, I didn't know much about him other than that he was at Port Macquarie in 1839 and was a settler there and had convict labourers, clearly, in the diary referred to the convict labourers. And so the University of Newcastle put out a media release saying that there was this volume and we'd found that the author of the diary was a Colonel Gray from Port Macquarie. A week later, we got an email from a lady saying, my name is Anne Hancock, and I am the great-great-granddaughter of Colonel Gray. And so she got in touch with us, and she and her sister um, have been vo most helpful to me, and they have given me permission to reproduce two great documents that 
Colonel Grey wrote, because he was in India from 1804 to 1807, fighting as a lieutenant. He was in the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, from 1810 to 1814. And he wrote, in both cases, he wrote documents later in life explaining firsthand what it was like to be a soldier in those uh, parts of the world. He then went on to fight in the Waterloo campaign. Uh, he then married, had some children, went to India again, came back to uh, England and decided in 1837 that he would emigrate to Australia with his wife and children, which they did. He took up a settlement at Port Macquarie, which was worked by his convicts. And um, in the Great Depression of the late 1840s, early 1850s, like so many others who could no longer rely on free convict labour, had to work the property himself. Um, there was a general economic depression. He had to give up that work and get a real job. So he got a job as police magistrate at Ipswich in Queensland. And in those days, before there were such things as councils and mayors and so on, the police magistrate in a place like Ipswich was the most important man in the town. And when Queensland was able to become a state in 1859, the new governor came in, Sir, Charles, uh, Sir George Ferguson Bowen. Uh, he and his wife visited Ipswich. Naturally, they were received by the police magistrate. Colonel Gray so impressed uh, the governor that the governor said to him, we've got a parliament starting next year, 1860. Would you like to be usher of the Black Rod and parliamentary librarian? Of course, in those days, Queensland had a bicameral system of parliament and uh, it had an upper house as well as a lower house. And the usher of the Black Rod was the um, counterpart in the upper house of the sergeant at arms in the lower house. And he was the first parliamentary librarian of Queensland. So he had the great choice as to what books went into the library. And he stayed in that position for not very long, something over a year or so. Then he went back to being police magistrate at Ipswich. By now he's a man in his 70s. If you can imagine what it was like traveling from Ipswich to Brisbane and back by pony and trap on terrible roads in those days, it's no wonder he couldn't keep that up for very long. He went back to, be, to continue as police magistrate um, and he continued in that role until about 1870 or so uh, when he eventually retired and uh, he lived for a few more years and his funeral when he died in 1873 was the largest funeral ever held in Ipswich. He was, he was almost the father of Ipswich, this man. So I've put together his life story, as much of it as we can piece together, and Central Queensland University Press are very kindly publishing it. And uh, it contains these never before published first-hand accounts of what it was like in India in 1804-1805. For instance, as a lieutenant in India, he had 19 servants. And he lists the titles of them all and how much they were paid and their duties. I don't think that stuff's ever been published before. And um, so I'm hoping that people will find, when they read the book, that there is a lot of quite new information firsthand about fighting in, against Napoleon, fighting in India, and so on in those early days of the 19th century.